In this lecture, we're looking at Soren and Kierkegaard and his philosophy of existentialism. You'll see in this lecture that Kierkegaard has some very strong pro-religious leanings. Uh, this is not so of all existentialists by any means. We'll soon be looking at another existentialist, uh, Frederick Nietzsche, uh, who is an atheist. Soren Kierkegaard has one of the most infamous names, uh, nicknames uh, in philosophy. Uh, being from Denmark, of course, he's uh, Danish, and, and uh, because he had such a depressive affect uh, and uh, was also um, a, really didn't have much of a sense of humor at all, he was known as the Melancholy Dane, uh, was his nickname. And uh, he was scorned by most of his contemporaries because not only was he always uh, depressed, but he was also very cynical and uh, could certainly be taken as arrogant also. But the contemporaries not only uh, disliked Kierkegaard for these personal reasons, but they were also very dismissive of his philosophy because Kierkegaard was introducing an entirely new way to do philosophy that was based upon subjective experience, whereas what had been praised and treasured in the predecessors of Kierkegaard, going back to the Enlightenment time with uh, Descartes and Locke, was this um, striving for objectivity, that only through being objective could you arrive at knowledge and truth. And we certainly had seen this with uh, David Hume and Immanuel Kant, and uh, these are the philosophers that were exalted by Kierkegaard's contemporaries, and because he bucked against them, uh, we see that he is dismissed and uh, is pretty much forgotten within a generation after his death. As far as uh, religion is concerned, Kierkegaard was very critical of any national church uh, as an uh, institution into which one was born. Um, Kierkegaard did not think uh, that you could be born into the church, but that you had to make a decision, a choice to be part of the church. And uh, in his writings, when Kierkegaard is very critical of this idea of being uh, born into the church, uh, he, it, almost as if, as if Christian was an ethnicity or a race rather than a decision, uh, Kierkegaard used the terms Christendom and Christianity to compare and contrast these two different ways of looking at religion. Christendom, of course, represented the national church, that it is an institution into which one is born, and uh, Christianity instead is a personal choice, a decision that one makes to follow Christ. And uh, there are many, it's not just a one-time decision for Kierkegaard, but there are daily decisions that have to be made to really be a Christian. He uh, died at a, a young age. He was only 42 uh, years old and was impoverished, so a uh, very unhappy life this man lived. But then amazingly, almost 90 years after his death, uh, there is a wave of theologians in both Europe and America who rediscover Kierkegaard's works and they find great value in them. Uh, this has to do with a couple of world events that had just taken place early in the 20th century. It is the aftermath of World War I and then also in the United States you had the Great Depression. And uh, because of these two tragic events, Kierkegaard's philosophy begins to make a lot of sense to these theologians and uh, church teachers. Um, Remember that the assumption of liberalism was that humanity was getting better and better all the time, evolving into a more ethical species. Um, Kierkegaard uh, did not uh, think that this was true of humanity, and instead says that humanity throughout all generations have to make these very hard choices and sacrifices to truly follow Christian faith. And I think you can probably connect the dots there after World War I and uh, the economic collapse of the Great Depression. It's kind of hard to believe that humanity is getting better and better all the time. And so Kierkegaard, who had been rejected during his own lifetime, is now embraced uh, in the early 20th century. Now the name that has been given to Kierkegaard's philosophy is existentialism. Uh, and uh, Although you see uh, that he has an inclination toward Christian faith, I don't want you to in any way understand that existentialism is tied uh, to a particular re religious viewpoint. Uh, it's not at all. As a matter of fact, uh, there are very well-known existentialist philosophers who are atheists. Uh, we'll be looking at one of them very soon. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche is an existentialist and also an atheist. So uh, do not view the term existentialism as having any inherent claim upon a religious disposition. 
Now, what is unique about existentialism as opposed to what we've seen with Kant and Hume and those who've come before is that uh, existentialism is going to focus upon the subjective human experience rather than supposing that philosophy can somehow provide an objective system uh, that will give our lives order. Um, now, we see with uh, Hume that he thought that it was very limited how much that objective system could give you, but still it was an objective system he was attempting to provide. Uh, now we have Kierkegaard doing something completely different here, as he focuses on human experience and how subjective uh, that is, and also how limited human existence is of the, the realization that we are finite, that our lives in the grand scope of things are very, very short, and this brings about some uh, very, uh, uh, some very deep and profound questions about what it means to be human, and also what does it even mean to exist. And some of you may have asked, or maybe you will one day ask these existentialist questions. And there are some people that, that never do. We're uh, wired in different ways. Um, some basic existentialist questions would be: uh, Does my life have any meaning or purpose? Uh, when I die, will I cease to exist? Is that the end of me, or is there something after this life? And uh, if, if there is uh, a God, uh, how am I supposed to relate uh, to that God? Now, Kierkegaard, again, was a committed Christian, but for him this had very little to do with what he believed. He didn't care so much about doctrine or dogma, uh, saying a particular creed. Uh, it wasn't about what he believed, but instead it was about what he would do, uh, the very hard choices that he would have to make, and that would, uh, of course, bring about the path that his life would take. Um, he realized that every choice that we make, while it does open up one path toward our future, it also closes all the other paths that we could have taken. And so Kierkegaard uh, takes everyday decisions uh, with a great deal of, of gravity that we really need to think carefully about the decisions uh, that we make. And uh, Kierkegaard would actually have one book called Fear and Trembling, in which he focused upon a passage uh, written by Paul in the uh, uh, New Testament, in a letter called Philippians. Uh, Paul writes that uh, salvation is something that uh, we must work out with fear and trem trembling. And the reason Kierkegaard obviously latched on to that phrase is because he... he believes that uh, life is a gravely serious matter and that life cannot be lived well without faith in God. Now besides fear and trembling, uh, the other written work by Kierkegaard uh, that I would uh, like you to have some familiarity with is a book called Either Or. And uh, here Kierkegaard focuses in on uh, one biblical story a troubling biblical story that has remained an enigma uh, with a variety of interpretations. Uh, it's in the Hebrew Bible, uh, sometimes called the Old Testament by Christians, and so therefore uh, rabbis from the Jewish faith and theologians from the Christian faith have given dozens of interpretations to this story, uh, but it still remains a, a troubling story, and it's the story of Abraham, a man uh, with whom God had made a covenant uh, even in his old age, uh, Abraham and his wife uh, Sarah are promised uh, that they will uh, be able to have a son. And they eventually do have a son named Isaac. And so Abraham's waited his entire life for this promise. And, and now he's so pleased that he has this son Isaac. And then one day uh, God commands Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And uh, it's, it appears to be a test of Abraham's faith. And here we start to get into all these variety of interpretations. There are some that say Abraham loved Isaac so much that God had become jealous, and so this is why God's going to have him sacrifice Isaac. Um, there are others uh, from the Christian perspective that will say that this is setting up an archetype of what Christ will be, that uh, Abraham will not end up sacrificing Isaac because uh, God will stop him in the last moment from making this sacrifice. Uh, but, of course, uh, in, from the Christian perspective, Christ, much later in, in his, uh, time, uh, will actually be sacrificed according uh, to that faith tradition. So uh, here we have this story about God telling a man to kill his very own son and then stopping him in the last moment. How does Kierkegaard use this story? Well, he uses it in the conclusion of a passage in Either Or where he is describing three different stages that a person can be in uh, during the course of his or her life. And uh, Kierkegaard writes with the hope that persons will eventually mature 
into the third and final stage, which involves taking a leap of faith. The uh, most basic a stage in which one can live that would be the most shallow life, according to Kierkegaard, is the aesthetic stage, and this is where one lives only for pleasure and is very reluctant to make commitments. Um, Kierkegaard uses primarily the relationship of, uh, of uh, sexual intercourse here to describe a man who uh, jumps from bed to bed to be with as many women as he possibly can be, and uh, he thinks that this is the good life because he has so many different women and so many different experiences. Uh, but Kierkegaard makes the remark that this is a very shallow life indeed because in thinking he knows all of these women, he really knows none of them uh, because there is no depth to their relationship. Now, one can mature to the ethical stage, and in the ethical stage, uh, commitments are made. So uh, this would be a commitment to uh, one woman to continue with the example that Kierkegaard was using and in choosing to uh, limit your sex life to just one woman and make that commitment to her, then therefore there's going to be a relationship of great depth that will uh, uh, take place over time. But Kierkegaard also says the ethical stage has its limitation because ethical decisions, uh, moral actions, are uh, performed based on human reason. Uh, this is still the idea that we as humans can set up some sort of objective system of determining knowledge and truth and that we can uh, base our decisions on that system that we have come up with rather than basing our decisions on faith in God. And so finally for Kierkegaard, uh, we should mature to the stage that Abraham was at in this story of the near sacrifice of Isaac, that at the religious stage, uh, we obey God. And so uh, whatever God has commanded us to do, it could be a test of our obedience uh, we follow through with what God has told us to do, trusting that if it is a test, God will intervene at the necessary time to uh, keep us on the right path. Now, I um, want to let you all know that uh, I'll, un I'll be un uh, un unlikely able to uh, put up any new lectures this next week because I will be leaving to make a week-long trip to Texas. Um, so there may be some delays and some emails uh, to get those uh, back to you, uh, but I will have my computer with me the entire time and will be checking email uh, daily, so I'll do my best to stay in touch with you all. Um, I will be putting up a new reading quiz sometime this next week, and uh, I didn't give you a, a little bonus question that you could answer on the last lecture, so let me do that for you now. While I'm in Texas, I'll be in several different places, but the primary reason I'm going is to officiate a wedding uh, for a friend of mine who's getting married this coming Saturday. Uh, he is getting married in the city of Waco, Texas, and if you can send me an email telling me the name of the major university, now there's some other smaller colleges, but there is one major university that is in Waco, Texas, and if you email me the name of that university, I will put 10 points on your most recent quiz. All right, thanks a lot. Bye.